Take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Not a few people have reminded me this morning before the service that I said last night this would be another Christmas miracle and a short sermon. Young people, adults, they've all done it. So uh, I'm going to learn one of these days to quit saying things off the cuff. I'll, one day, no, we'll try it. This morning I want us to continue thinking about the Christology of the New Testament and the way that, that the New Testament interprets that event in Bethlehem. Uh, we did that last night as we looked at Colossians chapter 1. And we saw there in Colossians chapter 1 the, um, uh, the expression that the Apostle Paul gave about who this one was, the preeminent one, that his birth, his life, his sacrifice made him preeminent, gave him the first place over all things and in all things. And for that, we gloriously rejoice. Well, this morning, I want us to see what the writer of Hebrews says about this Christology. It, it would not be an overstatement at all to say that the entire book of Hebrews is one major statement of Christology, of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews is, is writing this book to encourage uh, exiles, to encourage weary and, and wavering Christians, those who are struggling with what it means to be faithful and struggling with what it means to be in Christ and, and, and to live in a difficult world. And, and so he writes to them and gives them, those who are weary and wavering, he gives them what we might say is the glorious and unworth, unwavering truth that Jesus Christ has come as a fulfillment to all the promises and expectations of the Old Testament because he has come as God incarnate that's what hebrews wants us to understand that that even though we're in a world that is difficult and even though that we live in a world that that has all sorts of things coming against us and coming upon us and and coming at us every single day that even though we may struggle and we may waver and and we may even we may even become very weary at times our Lord Jesus Christ is a mighty God, and our Lord Jesus Christ is the incarnate God, and he is glorious, and he is unwavering in everything. The writer of Hebrews wants you to know that and to live that out every single day. So, so to bring true comfort and encouragement to these struggling people of God, the, the author knows that he must emphasize the dual identity of Jesus Christ. And throughout this book, he talks about the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, the dual identity. He is the God-man. He's not half God, half man. He's 100% God and 100% man in, in a union that is, is mysterious, to say the least. But it's a union that is glorious. And it's a union that we come to celebrate and rejoice in on Christmas morning. Hear the word of the Lord. From Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, at many times and in many different ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, and he, continue, he, he talks about the last days as they have been inaugurated, and he was living in the last days, and we are living in the last days. They are, they are a unit together. It's not he's in the last days and someday there'll be some really last days. From the time of Christ's coming until the time of his return is the last days. And so he says he has spoken, but, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Or to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, the day I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 
And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers flames of, a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. This is the word of the Lord. When the writer of Hebrews begins this word of encouragement to these pilgrims, these struggling Christians, across the world, he starts out by saying, I want you to understand that to have an all-sufficient Lord and Savior, Christ must be both human and divine. There has to be that dual nature. And he does that in several ways in this passage. He does it, first of all, by three contrasts, and then he does it by five statements of his, of his, his authority and of his power. He begins with the contrast by contrasting the timing of God's revelation to stress the chronological superiority of Christ's coming. He says, in those days, long ago, he spoke through the prophets. And we have those prophets. We have Isaiah and Jeremiah, and we have all the prophets that, that spoke the word of God and spoke to the people of God and called them to repentance and called them to righteous living. We have all of that in the scripture. It, it's very clear. And, and this statement of, of, of the writer of Hebrews in no way undermines their authority. They spoke the word of God clearly and authoritatively, and that is a good word from God. We still study the prophets today. But... In these last days, the contrast chronologically is that he is showing the chronological superiority of his, of his revelation in Christ Jesus, in his Son. In, in the old days and in the present days, in the old days and the last days, he is now speaking to us chronologically through his Son. The second contrast stressed the qualitative superiority of God's, superiority of God's revelation in Christ when he says in verses 1 and 2, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in his last days he has spoken us to his, through his son. The, and then he goes on and quotes the Old Testament in the latter part of the verses we read and speaks about, family day's great, don't worry, I love it. He speaks to us, he, he, he quotes the Old Testament prophets, and he says, this is what he has done. This is what he has said. He says, you are my son. You're not, you're not just a servant. You're not a minister. You're not an angel. You're my son. And qualitatively, as well as chronologically, Jesus' revelation is superior. And, and then third, he contrasts the personal superiority of God's revelation in Christ. For, for when God spoke through the prophets, there was an indirect thing. Now he has spoken in his son in his personal nature of speaking directly to his people. So in those contrasts, he shows that Christ's coming was necessary, and he shows that Christ's coming is superior in every way to the old covenant. He has brought a new covenant. But, but then he says five things about his, the coming of Jesus that's very important. First of all, he says the Son is the one whom God has appointed as heir of all things. In, in other words, in coming in that Bethlehem manger, God is coming into the world through his son, and he's saying, listen, he is the owner. He is the, he is the one who has everything, and everything belongs to him. There is nothing that he will see or touch that is not his. And he wants us to understand the glory of that truth in, in the coming of Christ. He is the heir of all things. Everything that belongs to God belongs to him. Now, we are told later that we will be joint heirs with him. We who are in Christ, we become adopted into the family of God. Jesus was the only natural-born son, natural son in the family of God. But we are adopted into the family of God, and we become heirs with him, joint heirs with Christ. And for that, we glory and we rejoice. But it's all on the basis of that baby that was born in that manger to bring the new and the fresh revelation of God. The second thing he says is that the Son is the one through whom also God 
created the world. In the second half of, of that first, of that second verse, by whom he created the world. He created everything there is. When he spoke in the in the beginning, let there be light, and there was light. When he spoke in the beginning, and, and he, cre- he separated the waters and the land, and, and everything in those days of creation, the animals, the, the, the vegetation, and ultimately human beings, every one of those he created through his son, Jesus Christ. And as we saw last night, they were created through him, and by him, and for him. They are for his glory. They're for his enjoyment. That's why we are called to enjoy God. That's why we are called to to glory in who he is, to enjoy our relationship with him. And in this season, to know it even more, because everything that has been created, including you, was for the enjoyment of Christ and for us to enjoy also. He's the one through whom God created the world. Thirdly, He says, as Paul did last night, and as we looked at Colossians chapter 1, the the writer of Hebrews says, the Son is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. There is the deity of Christ shining through. Yes, he had flesh and blood and bones, and he he got hungry, and he suffered uh, infirmities as we do as far as hunger and thirst goes. The scripture makes that very clear. He, he had those human uh, needs as we have. He needed to eat. He needed to sleep. He needed rest. He withdrew to do that from time to time. But, but in his divine nature, he is the radiance of God's glory. There's no doubt, no wonder that on that night when the star appeared and the angels appeared to the shepherds, out in the fields and said a great great light shone all about as the heavens opened up and pointed toward that Bethlehem manger and said, that's my son. That's the glory of God come in the flesh. That's the glory of God come to dwell and live among us. And he's the exact imprint of God's nature. There was no sin. There was no wavering. There was no deficiency in him at all he is the radiance of God's glory he is the exact expression of God's nature fourth the right of Hebrews talks about his his providence the the providence of God in Jesus Christ not only is he the exact glory of God but he says in that second part of verse three and he upholds the universe by the word of his power Even as that baby lying in a manger, he was holding the universe together. It was his word, his power, his strength that holds everything that there is in place and together. Whether it's the stars in the sky or the earth itself or the molecules of your body, he holds them together. Were he to speak the word and remove his word from his providence and providential care over his people and over his world, everything would just disintegrate right before his very eyes. He is a providential God who upholds all things by the power of his word. When those Hebrew Christians struggling and wavering and wondering what in the world was going on, when they heard those words that he upholds the the whole universe by the power of his word, they knew that he upheld them also. That even though they had doubts and even though they had struggles, even though there were people who wanted to wipe them out and wipe the name of Christ from the face of the earth that they had pledged allegiance to and entered into covenant relationship with, even though all those things were happening, they knew that he was there to protect them and to uphold them and to guard them. Final thing the writer of Hebrews says about this one is that the Son is the one who after making purification for sins, what is that? It's the cross. After making purification for sins, that is shedding his blood, that sin might be purified, that sin might be forgiven, 
that those who believe might have their sins totally eradicated, totally forgiven. Not temporarily, not, not as long as you could remember to confess everyone and repent of every single one, but that sins were eradicated completely in the atonement of Christ for all who believe. That's an amazing statement. He made purification. Purification for sin. Purification for your sin and my sin. He, he, he brought us into a, a new standing of righteousness by his imputed righteousness. As, as Paul said uh, to the Corinthians, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And a paraphrase that could be, so that we who have no righteousness might have his righteousness. Be his righteousness in this world. So it was not just enough that sins would be forgiven. It was not just enough that there be a legal declaration, your sins are forgiven. But it required something else, being qualified to enter into the presence of God in worship and in heaven. And that qualification was his purification. So as, as the writer of Hebrews writes to these believers, he's saying, yes, we rejoice in the incarnation. We rejoice in the virgin birth. We rejoice in his coming in Bethlehem. But oh, that was just the beginning. We rejoice in the work of Christ on the cross. But not only that, he ascended. After making purification for sins, after doing his work of atonement on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And then he quotes all those Old Testament references to talk about the superiority of Christ over the angels and over all creation. But I want you to hear this. When Christ was on the earth, he walked the earth, he, he did miracles, he went to the cross, he died, he rose again, and then he walked some more for 40 days with those who were his disciples. After those 40 days, he ascended. Scripture records how they were standing there watching him and he was taken up into heaven, and he ascended into heaven. And when he got to heaven, he sat down. Indicating that his work was finished. He had said that on the cross, you remember? When he cried with a loud voice, it is finished. Talking about the work that he came to do. Talking about the the atonement that he came to accomplish, it is finished. It is done. And when he arose and ascended and sat down, the writer of Hebrews is just saying, don't miss this. There will be no new revelation. There will be no new atoning factor. There will be no new atoning sacrifice. There will no, there'll be nothing new from this point on. Christ has revealed it all. Every bit of it. Christ has done his work and now has declared by sitting down that it is finished. There is no more glorious truth in all of Scripture. There is no more glorious thing to celebrate on Christmas Day. That Christ the Lord has come and Christ the Lord has died and Christ the Lord has risen and ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father, now interceding on our behalf, praying for us, loving us, if you will, from afar in one sense, but present through His Spirit daily in the lives of believers, praying for us, interceding for us, just as He did in the garden in John 17, when he prayed that we would be made holy, when he prayed that we would be protected from the evil one, when he prayed that we would see his glory and know his joy in this world. So we come to Christmas. We celebrate the joy that is in Christ. 
We come to Christmas morning and we sing these hymns and we sing hallelujah, praise your name, glory to the name of Christ. And we don't just sing that as some kind of religious exercise. We sing that as reality. We sing it as reality. Christ the Lord reigns forever and ever. Christ the Lord is God's final word of revelation. And as he, as he was interpreted by the apostles in the New Testament, he shows us all that we need to know about God and about salvation and about living. He doesn't tell us everything, but he tells us all we need to know. And on this Christmas, we rejoice in that reality. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the goodness of the glory of Christ. We thank you, Father, for your love and for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.